we've all grown up with that kid in the neighborhood or the school who just seems a little bit off. Often they're thought of as odd but harmless, a nuisance rather than a threat. You cross the street when you see them coming or you head in a different direction or you just ignore them completely. But are these the exact people we should be walking toward and not away from? After a tragedy like Sandy Hook or Virginia Tech or Columbine or Aurora, we hear people saying, we saw the signs. So how do we know the difference between different and dangerous? Can we spot this before it happens? Back with us is Dr. Joshua Weiner, who's a board certified, who's board certified in both adult and child adolescent psychiatry. How are you, doctor? I'm fine, thanks. So we're talking about warning signs here. What are some of the commonalities that you notice in people who have done these sort of things so we can start to build a thought process around what are these warning signs? Well, you know, I think the one thing that people need to be aware of is actually as a psychiatrist, it is so hard to predict when somebody's going to be violent, whether that be suicide or doing something that's dangerous to somebody else. So I think it would be almost unreasonable to try to pigeonhole the specific type of person that's going to commit these things. With that said, however, I think we do need to look out for people who have had a track record of violence, people who are doing things like talking to others about the fact that they're fantasizing about hurting people, stockpiling weapons, posting things on their Facebook. These are all obvious things, but it's really hard to identify who's going to be just that weird person who's not really a danger. They might not be functioning well in society, but they're not going to go out and hurt themselves or others versus the person who's going to do such a horrific act. But it seems that uh, many people have mentioned this, that there seems to be an over preponderance of this is the, the loner, the antisocial person who is sort of like separating themselves from society, um, often early 20s, often white, often male. Uh, right. and, and it's hard to say, let's take these warning signs and, and do something about it, because a lot of times these people never let anybody get close enough to know that there's really something wrong going on. I know. And, you know, you do... You do see those trends. So as you mentioned, there are, some, there are some specific characteristics that are common with a lot of these people. But the thing is, we're talking about millions of kids out there who are like this. So how do you find that needle in the haystack? How do you know which one of those kids who share those traits is going to be the one who's going to go on to do these things? That's why, to me, what I think is really important to focus on right now as a country is preventative measures. What can we do? And for me, I think the issue really starts with destigmatizing mental illness. And I think mm -hmm. the best place to start with that is in the school system. I think that from a very early age, schools should be teaching kids about social and emotional development. They need to be teaching kids about how to interact with people that are different, how to be accepting, how to deal with conflict, basically how to get along in the world, because we know that these are skills that actually can be taught, and these are skills that actually end up correlating more with success in life than your IQ. So mm -hmm. if you have a good, what we call, emotional quotient, then you're actually much more likely to be successful professionally, have a happy marriage, do well with your kids, and overall find yourself satisfied in life. So there are things that can be done, and I think these things need to be taught in the school. I think it's important, obviously, for our kids to learn arithmetic and English, but as a parent, what do I care most about? I care most about my child being happy and well-adjusted, getting along with other kids, and being prepared to be a productive, successful person in society. Uh, Dr. Reiner, I want to play some sound from President Obama yesterday and get your reaction. We will be told that the causes of such violence are complex, and that is true. No single law, no set of laws can eliminate evil from the world or prevent every senseless act of violence in our society. But that can't be an excuse for inaction. Surely we can do better than this. Doctor, you mentioned some things that we could be doing in the schools, but clearly our mental health system is failing our children in many ways. What other kinds of conversations should we be having about mental health right now? Well, I think that we need to look at more funding for mental health treatment and availability and access to mental health treatment. 
you know, right now I'm actually dealing as a psychiatrist in my practice with a kid who could be an Adam Lanza. And as a psychiatrist, it is really difficult to deal with these issues. And mm. the mom calls me crying, saying, what can we do for my son? This is a boy who just a couple weeks ago held his mom at, at knife point and then made a suicide attempt, oh. landed himself in the hospital. He was at a great hospital, Johns Hopkins University. But he was there for just two weeks. And then once he no longer seemed to be of imminent danger, which is what the criteria is, you need to be at imminent risk of killing yourself or somebody else, he was then discharged and sent back to my care. The problem is he refuses to come and see me, mm. and he's giving his parents mm. a real fuss with taking the medication. So what do we do with these kids? What I think we need to do is there need to be more services available for these families. We need to have programs and institutions where kids can go for long-term treatment. I mean, these problems do not start overnight, and they're not going to be cured overnight. So there needs to be a place where kids can go and go for a sustained period of time, months. We're not talking about days. Mm -hmm. And that's the amount of time that it really takes to help people get better. Well, well doctor, I mean, you mentioned talking to a mother who, who's, who's really worked up and concerned about, about her son. What is the practical advice then for a parent um, who feels that way about their kid? What practically speaking are the steps they should be taking? This is so hard. It is so difficult. What I tell her is she needs to make sure that she's gotten rid of all medications. She's gotten rid of all knives, obviously making sure that there are no guns in the house, nothing that can be used as a weapon against Again, that he can use against himself or anyone else in the family. But then I say, you know, sometimes if things get out of control, you need to call the police. But that's a horrible situation yeah. for a parent to be on. Do you really want to call the police on your 14-year-old child <laughs> or 17-year-old kid? It can become a big mess after that. Right. So the problem is really there is no place right now for us to turn to. <laughs> and so that's what needs to happen. There needs to be a place. I mean, there are some places, but these places are extremely difficult for people to get their kids in. To, and they cost an absolute fortune. You're looking at maybe over $100,000 a year wow. for a kid to go to a program. And so who has that kind of money? Mm. <coughs> wow. Destigmatizing mental illness is extremely important but extremely hard. Dr. Weiner, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. We'll be back with more of our special coverage on The Cycle.